Well, welcome to a lovely episode of the Go To Book Club, where I'm talking to Sarah Wells, who's going to be sharing some insights from her recently published book, Enabling Microservice Success. Sarah, thank you so much for coming along today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm always, I, I, we're going to get right into all of the awesome insights you have to share in the book and more, but I thought it'd be great if you could maybe just introduce yourself a bit and, and maybe talk about what you do today and maybe what your background is in IT. Yeah, sure. So what I do today is I'm an independent consultant. I work with a section of different clients um, talking about uh, engineering, engineering leadership, culture. Um, this is my first time working independently. I've always had permanent jobs. Uh, the most recent one was at the Financial Times. I was there for a long time. I was there for 11 years. Um, I worked in IT for ooh, about 25 years. Uh, it's the second career. I originally worked in in uh, scientific book pub production. And I went and did a master's course and learned how to code. Worked as a software developer for, for quite a long time and then became a principal engineer and then a technical director. Yeah, and, and so... Uh, just to let people a little bit inside, we're not going to talk too much about inside baseball about books, but because of Sarah's background, she's an awesome person to review books. She reviewed two of my books and you get excellent like insights, fantastic copy editing. So, you know, um, and it was also, I got to review Sarah's book and it was also good to see that you actually understood things like how to spell and grammar, which are things that pass me by. But um, it's always great that when you have had like other careers before IT, there's always like having a you know, different backgrounds. There's loads of new skills you can kind of bring into what you do. Mm. I guess the kind of uh, what that leads me to thinking about what the main focus is of the book. So it's called enabling microservice success, but could you maybe explain what the whole what, what, what is it? What does it encompass? What what was your why did you want to write it and what's its main focus? So I wanted to write it because I spent a long time uh, at the FT working with microservices. We were very early adopters and felt like I learned a lot about what to do and what not to do and how important the cultural and organizational sides of things were. So you can easily focus on discussing what the architectural patterns are with microservices. But if you haven't got the right sort of team structure in place and you don't approach things in in the right way. And sometimes that is different for microservices than it was for previous ways of working, say the monolith, then you can get yourself into a world of pain where microservices require a lot more effort. And if you're not benefiting from that, you're just you're just paying a cost that, that you don't get any anything for. I, I think the thing I liked about your book, and this partly comes again to the roles you played at the Financial Times, you said you mentioned about culture and leadership and a lot of people might be thinking, oh, we hear about this stuff all the time in the context of development. But you actually had a bit more of a focus into maybe more traditional spaces within the world of IT, looking at things like disaster recovery and business continuity planning and, you know, data centers springing a leak and all those sorts of things. So when you're talking about organizational culture, it goes way beyond, I am a developer in my box, much more to we're a large, complex IT organization. Here's what sort of has to happen if you want to get the most out of these things. So could, could you maybe maybe expand a little bit on some of the roles you played um, sort of more, more recently, just before you left the Financial Times? Mm. So um, I had been a, a Java tech lead for a long time and, and then a principal engineer running the uh, content API team. But because we were building a microservices architecture, we had to really care about running it in production. It was the first time I'd really had to focus on what does it mean to build something that you can run and operate in production. And I ended up like commenting on a proposal for um, how we were going to do out of hours support from development teams, because we'd really begun to buy into the DevOps idea that you build it, you run it. The only people who can run the system in production, when it's changing as rapidly as you want it to be changing when you've got a microservices architecture, are the people that, that built it. You may have support for the platform underneath it, but you're the ones that understand your application. And that ended up uh, leading to me moving across to be a technical director um, for operations and reliability. So I'd never done any kind of operational st st type role. And that's that. I took that job up and didn't realize that... that um, disaster recovery and, recovery and business continuity were going to be part of the things I should care about. 
but they're all they're all very related. You realize that if you've done operational support and you've done chaos engineering, actually those are applicable to planning for planning for um, business continuity. So this is a complete tangent from the book, but <laughs> when we had to when we had to go remote um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we'd actually been preparing for a month or so before that by sending individual departments to work from home for a day. So we were doing the practice of you've now got to work from home, but in a in a constricted sense so that the service desks weren't, weren't overwhelmed and so that we had some continuity, we could send like part of a group home. So we were using things we had learned from operational uh, incidents and operational practices uh, in a, in a non-technology part of the organization. One of the, the insights you shared with me in the past was that whole you build it, you run it, you ship it thing is thinking about out of our support. There's saying, there's selling people on the idea, which you know I do all the time. And then there's actually making that idea a reality. Mm. So uh, I don't know, you touch it in the book as well, but what were some of the challenges in terms of what you actually had to do to make you build it, you run it, you ship it a reality? And like, how does transitioning to out of our support, what, what sort of things have to happen? Well, there's, there's, first of all, there's a real, this general kind of working uh, and HR part of it, which is quite often the organization doesn't have anything in people's contracts that talks about doing out of our support. Um, and people are concerned about doing it because they're worried that they're going to be unable to live their normal life, that they're going to get called up all the time. People have lives outside work. They want to be able to go um, go for a walk without having phone reception. <laughs> they want to be able to pick their kids up from school without worrying about about that sort of thing. And I think you have to consider that. You have to, um, if you want people to support the stuff in production, you have to assure them that there will be space to build resilient, robust systems that are very unlikely to have uh, problems. So for a lot of our systems at the FT, they're very rare for them to have a, a production incident. And quite often, those would be things where we didn't have a lot of control over it. So it might be a CDN provider having an outage where actually you may have a backup or you may just have to, to work out how you're going to to cope with that for a period of time until it's until it's fixed but it, i think people will sign up for they will sign up for doing uh, out of our support if they don't feel it's going to take over their life so, so you start off thinking about devops then you start thinking about you build it you run it you ship it and next thing you're going for employment contract it's hr so it's, it's, it sounds very glamorous but i'd imagine <laughs> and this obviously varies in different parts of the world i mean it is, I suspect, suspect like quite concrete discussions. Like, can I drink when I'm on when I'm on call? Can I go out for a restaurant? If I do get paid, am I expected to come into the office the next day? I'd imagine you just had to work through all of those things, talk to people, and find out who could do what. You do, and there, and there definitely are parts of the world where you can't ask people to do it out of our support on a on a formal like you are expected to do it. Um, we took an approach for a lot of the teams at the FT where it was um, it was opt in, so you could you could agree to be on a rotor, and we were very clear to people that you can choose to come off that rotor at any point, either for a short period of time or for a longer period of time. And we would have conversations where people said, that "I'm not able to do this for for whatever reason. It could be that you you just you just don't have the capacity to to be called up at three in the morning and." and deal with something. But that's fine because there are other things that you can be doing. So we would worry if we had no one signing up for the rotor, it's usually a sign that you actually haven't built a resilient system and that you haven't given people space to make the right architectural choices. Often though, you can, you can, you're saying to people, you get to make choices about the, the tools that you use and the way that you build this because you're going to support it. And that can be quite appealing. Um, when we started to introduce out of our support for our content uh, API team, we had a conversation about the architecture and said, what would make you feel comfortable? And it turned out that everyone said, well, actually the um, data store we're using, it's proprietary. We don't understand it. We can't look up any problems that people have with it. We want to make a, a change. So we moved to a different data store before we went live because that gave the team a conviction that if something went wrong, they, had, they could basically look up other people's uh, experiences and find help. I, and I think that is always the, I, I think it's, I've heard Michael Nygaard say, sort of talking about it in terms of architectural changes, that an architect doesn't change immediately. It's like change is like a wave crashing over the system. It's like change happens at different rates. That does sort of happen organizationally as well. Like you, 
it starts by having those conversations person to person, making that little change happen. And not everybody and not every team, I guess, can move at the same rate. And even um, the services they look after, you know, they might be comp- too complicated to be, they can, they're not ready for that world. So I guess it's also, it sounds like it's being open to the fact this change isn't going to be immediate and it won't be one size fits all straight away. Well, there are, there are two things that that makes me think about. One is that actually it's important to consider which of your services actually need out of our support. It's very easy to say everything needs to be supported out of ours, but there will be some that, that don't. And we had a very strong categorization at the FT, which was, you know, we, we, we platinum, gold, silver, and bronze systems. Really, bronze and platinum were the two we mostly used. Bronze was something that um, is not required to be supported out of ours. Platinum is, and that means it needs to be multi-region. So you're giving the teams that l- extra level of resilience where it's unlikely that it's less likely there'll be a problem because you've lost an availability zone or, or a region. This, so that was the, the first thing. The second thing you made me think about was um, that actually lots of the change we did around um, how we did out of our support, we did it on a, we're going to try this for three months. So we, so there was debate the whole time that I was a tech director there about where we're going to move out of our support onto a more um, formal footing where people got paid for it and they had to agree to definitely be there. And it never happened. It was, there was, there was a lot of debate. We stuck with the original, we're just going to try this out for three, three months. And at the time I left, that was still the way it was working. And people were generally happy with it. Although people really worry that they're going to try, have to phone and there'll be no one available who can, who can help. I, I want to come back to the gold, silver, bronze stuff in a minute. Cause I, I find that stuff like really interesting, but it might help to maybe set a little bit of context in terms of at this stage, what the financial times looked like in terms of size, scale, location, because often people be hearing things like this and thinking, oh, that's fine, but you're a small company, but you, you weren't, right? So, so at this point when, the, when you left, like how many people were actively developing software at the financial times and kind of where were you geographically? About 250 to 300 people working in, in software development teams, something like that, and spread across Two locations, so development uh, hub in London and in Sofia, and in Manila. Sorry, three three locations. Manila, um, l- largely operational, but also some uh, platform engineering teams as well. So when we're talking about this being quite informal and it just kind of seemed to work, and you kept on a rolling three months like this is not like a small ten person. When you're a smaller group, you can often make do things quite informally. Yeah. And people assume when you're bigger, you need lots of formality, but clearly you don't always. So I think the thing that's interesting for me is you need to, so the way we worked, it was best endeavors. There is a list, there are a list of people and that we had a first line operations team who would phone around and find someone who was available could answer the phone. And there was a definite sense of fear that this meant that you were not going to be able to find someone who can help. But if you had had a formal rotor, there is still a chance that the person that's on call today can't help for this particular thing because they didn't write that code and they don't know that part of the code base. Because you you have to have a rotor that covers more than one team because you cannot do a have a five four or five person development team doing out of hours on a formal rotor because you would be on call one week and three, which I think I think is excessive. So you never have that certainty. I think there's that thing about like the certainty that someone will pick up the phone is not certainty that that person is going to be able to fix the problem. And in a way, having a wider thing of we'll, we'll do our best, we'll find some people, maybe you'll be more likely to find a person who's available who does know how to fix this problem. I, I, I want to come back to the gold, silver, bronze so, and platinum model because that's something that I saw almost like a light switch went on when you first told me about that. So a lot of people have this challenge, and this is what goes all the way throughout the book, is we have now got a service. What's it mean to run it and to own it? And so the conversations then go to, okay, what kind of SLOs? What kind of uptime? What's my support rotor? We've got to kind of, and you, you, you see some companies where everyone tries to work that out themselves, in which case you end up with all kinds of mismatched things. Or there's a one size fits all, doesn't really make sense. So this felt like a really clever way of saying, is your service, which category does it fall into, do you think, based on need? Oh, if you're gold or if you're platinum, these are the things you need to do. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So how did you kind of evolve those levels and and, and sort of what did those levels mean? So the, they'd been introduced before while while I was a a, um, tech leader, one of the teams. So I don't, I wasn't really involved in that first definition, the way that they evolved um, in practice, most systems were either platinum or bronze. We didn't find that the two in the middle, uh, the, the, ma- the main distinction was, is it multi-region and do people get called up if it breaks out of hours or is that not the case? Um, and those that worked pretty well. Uh, and it meant you understood, should I phone someone because this thing is broken? Um, and in terms of things like SLOs, there were some associated how long, we f- how long should we aim for uh, uh, a response? If, if something goes wrong, how quickly c- should we aim to get hold of someone? How quickly should someone be working on this? I think there was some definition of uh, how long to fix it. I'm I'm not really super convinced about that because I think you you are once you've got people working on it, they're going to fix it as soon as they can. So I I'd, I'd, I'd rather just say the main aim is to make sure we pick up through monitoring that there has been a problem and we get someone working on it who's got the ability to to try and mitigate it uh, as quickly as possible. One of the things I know you did do internally was was though try to give people guidance about the things that they should do. So yeah. there's often this conversation about the, the standardization, everyone, all the services should sort of behave the same way. Uh, and there's always a concern in that, which is people end up being constrained or they're given some framework they've got to use. But some of the things you did were quite interesting, which is you say, look, your service should be doing these things. Oh, and by the way, here's how you do it. Can you sort of explain how that worked internally? Yeah. So we had a we had an engineering checklist, sort of guardrails that said, when you're building a service and you, you're running it in production, we expect these things to happen. Um, there are tools to do them. Uh, if you're using one of our standard ways of deploying, maybe those tools, that maybe things are built in automatically. But if you do want to use some different approach because because that's going to help you, that's fine, but you need to comply with the guardrails. So an example might be um, we want every uh, release to production to be logged through a change API so that we know in one place everything that's changing. So if you're using one of the standard uh, CI, CD pipelines, that, that's quite simple. But if you're not, here's the API that you have to make sure is pulled from, from your pipeline. Um, and some of those things were a little bit more of a constraint than others. So uh, logging, we want people to produce useful logs of, of significant events, but actually we want them all to go to the same log aggregation place. Because if you don't have all the logs aggregated in a single place, you end up finding it very difficult um, if something goes wrong. And I had I had this example at the FT where we had an incident and we discovered that team who was experimenting with sending their their production logs somewhere different, but I didn't have access to those <laughs> as someone in the operations team. And I, and it wasn't really clear to me how I would get hold of it. And I think that that's, that is a sign of something that's, that you really need to have those things in a single place. Yeah. And there is that also, probably also something about picking your battles in these situations, Yeah, uh, which is, look, these are all the things you should do. Oh, and these ones we're serious about. Yes. And these ones we're going to help you do. And you probably, you know, it's, this is the whole kind of paved road idea, which is if you use the things we've got sort of standard, most of these things are going to happen for you without you having to do any work. If you've gone off piece, you can. But there are these things that we are quite serious about. It's like, uh, I've got nephews, right? And if you overreact about everything they do, then when they're getting near a kettle, they don't pay attention. You tell them not to touch it because it's hot, right? I know I have just compared developers to my four year old nephews, but. Yeah, there is a probably a bit of that that you have to pick your battles a little bit around these things internally, right? Yeah, I think so. I think you, you, yeah, and those guardrails are really the things that that are that are important to the organisation to the to to making sure that the organisation is secure, that we aren't incurring huge amounts of cost. Um, all, all those things are, are really important, and I think there's a lot to be. To, there's a couple of really useful things. One is building them into into tools. The second is making things really visible. So if you can show people how they're doing, um, and in particular, if you can show people that actually this thing we've asked you to do, everyone else is doing it, but you're not, that can really influence people. Um, I remember a very long time ago at the FT when I was running a team that the operations team started to send out an email periodically saying, these are the the noisiest uh, alerts that we have. 
And I completely ignored the email until my team was in the top 10, at which point it was like, yeah, we need to fix that because that's embarrassing. And we would do the same thing for, for some of the tools that we built. So for example, we had, um, we didn't have a, we had lots of run, run books had no information in. We wanted to make sure that there was a, enough information to help people find the right team, do things like um, failover or um, scaling up, just the, the information that would help you to try and mitigate stuff. So we started um, scoring the fields in the run book. And then we aggregated those scores together so we could say this service has got 80% of the necessary information in. And we aggregated that up so that we could show teams how they were doing. And at that point, you start to get a little bit gamification, but also people, some people get very competitive. We, we had people coming to our team and saying, why can't I get 100%? Why can't, why can't I do this? And we're like, oh, because we haven't quite got the rules right so that you can get 100%. Well, I want 100%. But that's, I mean, it's... It- it's sort of, you worry about those things if it encourages the opposite behavior of what you're hoping for. But it sounds like in most cases that wasn't what happened. And it was just about, but again, it comes back to you're making it clear this is important to you. You're letting people know how they're doing against it. You're explaining how they solve that problem and you're giving them visibility. And then I think most people want to do the right thing in those situations. Yeah. They're not going to circumvent things for the sake of it. They, they want to and yeah, developers love getting points, right? That's that's kind of, you know. Yeah, some, not everybody. But the other thing about it is, is honestly, there's so much that you need to do. And if you can give people it in a list where you say, these are the most important, then I think that that really works. We did similar things with security scanning. We, we wanted to show all of the things that people could do to improve security uh, and to prioritize them, to say, these are the ones that are most important for us Get, and set objectives around we're going to improve in this category because that's the one where we think we get the most value. Um, if you look back at the time at the Financial Times, thinking about that kind of early adoption of microservices all the way through, I mean, looking back, what were some of the things that really surprised you about that whole journey? Were there anything that sticks in your mind as things that were just like, I wasn't expecting that? Oh, um, I think um, that we, so it was very, so for us, we were so early that there was no tooling a lot of the times. There are lots of things now that you can basically get a tool for it. So we had to solve a lot of the problems ourselves. And we also um, found lots of things where, where no one had really pointed out that this was going to be very different. So testing, testing, for example, we started building microservices and we thought, oh yeah, we need to have um, acceptance tests. Well, they have to test a, a business flow. And then we just basically built ourselves an acceptance test that coupled every single service together. So we just had a distributed monolith. We all hated these tests because you could do no exaggeration, half hour code fix that would take a week to fix all the fixtures for the acceptance test because they were all had to have data set up. And at some point we just said, that's it. We're we're, we're basically going to remove these and we're going to find a solution that is better. So it really pushed us to thinking about um, monitoring as testing and in particular, testing as production. And, and actually, that, those were both massive improvements. So instead of having a suite of acceptance tests that ran during the release process, we had some synthetic monitoring that ran all the time. And it ran in production, not just in pre-production environments. So the first example we had was, let's publish uh, a, a real article, a real old article, and just republish it every minute and check that that publication went through our published process. So we'll know really quickly if some part of our publishing flow is broken, because that monitor will tell us that we can't any longer publish that, that article. And, and I think that, you know, production's what you care about. Production's where you want to know that something's gone wrong. And in modern software development systems, it could break for many reasons that are not related to a code release. I would want to know about those as well. So I just think the value of that kind of testing being in production and not as part of a release pipeline is, is huge. And I wasn't expecting that, that change. Um, both the, at your time at the Financial Times and even more so subsequently, you know, you, you're, you've been exposed to like a load more insights from what other companies have done, other case studies. And there's loads of that is in the book, right? It's, it's not, you know, yes, the Financial Times is always a big part of it, but there's loads of other insights that you've gained from wider across the industry again, sort of thinking about looking black, back, given the things you've learned subsequently, are there things that you wish you could have gone back and done differently? Were there, were there blind alleys that you went down and things you explored 
Whereas in hindsight, you're thinking, well, of course that wasn't going to work. Or, oh, if I could have gone, I wish we had that idea. I, we could have used that and that would have been so much better. So kind of what, if you had your time over again, I guess I'm saying, what would you do differently? <laughs> I, so I think actually you should get used to the idea that you do things and you decide that they were a bad move. I think that that's the whole point. You, you only benefit from uh, adopting something by being experimental and trying things and some of them won't work. I think you should accept, accept that. And like the idea is it should be easy to change and go back. The biggest thing about microservices was actually that we really, um, we really believed the whole, it's a hundred lines of code. They do a single thing. And we had so many microservices and the more that you have, the more it, it, the more it costs you to keep everything up to date. So we had a team of 15 that, that had 150 microservices. So when you have to upgrade a library, you have to upgrade it in a lot of places. If it takes you five minutes, that's still a lot of time. Uh, it wasn't enormously painful, but if I was doing it again, I would, I would compose them a bit more. I would have bigger microservices. And I think that, that generally what, what you want is, is something where the, it fits the boundaries of the team. So a team may have you know, two or three, depending on what they want to do, but but really it's about making sure that there a service is not shared across multiple teams. Uh, it, those really aggressive re, I mean, I, I, I kind of fascinated by that. I think the size thing is a meaningless concept with microservices and it is about the team boundary is kind of the constraining factor for me, but I also get quite interested in those ratios. And so what I do see in organizations where there's less awareness, there's less support, maybe there's a lot more manual processes involved. You might have, you might struggle to manage one microservice well for like a, a team of 15 developers. Whereas a, if you've done a load of stuff and lots of automation and you've, you've got tool chains and investments, you can be a bit more aggressive the other way. Yes. Um, I, I still kind of think like 10 to one is, is, you know, 10 services per developer is probably not healthy. No. Uh, I mean, I think, I don't, th I think some of the teams at Monzo are not far off that, but they yeah. do some very special things to make that work that most people don't get. Yes. Um, uh, so I, I tend to, I, I tend to agree with that sizing, by the way. It's like, I, I think it's, a team should own it. They can make it smaller. I mean, again, like, I suppose that kind of comes full circle. It's like, if the team is making the architectural decisions and the team is seeing the implications of those decisions because they're the ones supporting it over the long term, then they're the people best place to say, should I split it into 10? Should I have it as one? And that different teams might make different decisions, right? I guess that's sort of yeah. an organizational point of view, a big part of that, of why we do this, right? Absolutely. And, and I don't, certainly by the time I left the FT, people were not spending a lot of time putting all of these microservices back together. They, they felt like they'd, they'd invested the time to be able to run a lot of, of separate microservices. Yeah, I, I think, you're right. Monzo is a very interesting thing because they have a lot of standardization around how you expect to order service. The FT did not. There was a lot more variation between teams. So I think where you have a lot of standardization, it's quite easy to say, or easier to say, right, I'm building a new service to do this one thing. Um, but where you don't have that, it's, I feel like when I ask people 20 to 30 microservices in an organization feels, feels pretty like very like common as the number rather than 2000. I, and and the, the thing is, even if an organization has 2000, like but it's, it's not 2000 within one system. Yeah. So this is the other thing that people, this is why I think the ratio is still for me that my preferred number because, oh, we've got 2000 microservices. Yeah. But actually what you've got are discrete lines of service. And within each discrete line of service, you've got about a hundred people working on them. And in there, you've got about 30 services, right? That's yes. kind of more interesting. So it's, I'm always wary when you hear people saying, oh, we do X and we do Y and extrapolating from that. So. Mm -hmm. Also, like, don't measure success by how many services you have. I think the only people <laughs> that succeed in terms of you having more services are the people that are selling in your Kubernetes clusters, right? So, uh, um, so I guess you went through that whole experience at, at the, you know, and you, you've worked out how to make microservices work for you within the context of Financial Times. And you've also seen other companies that have tried, some of us failed at getting the most out of microservice architectures. That's what the whole book's about, right? It's enabling you to be successful with microservices. If you've got microservices, you should read the book. 
However, are you now, do, do you have a clearer view in terms of those, you know, it, are, are there situations where you just would not pick microservices where that for you it's like, is it, is it quite situational? Are there certain circumstances where you just think microservices should just be avoided? I feel like both you and I have a chapter in our books that say, here are all the places where you shouldn't use microservices. Because, because absolutely, it no, it's not helpful to, to go, I need to build microservices right now. And you've got a team of four people. I feel like microservices are generally, they're about solving organizational scaling issues where you've got enough people that it's difficult to know what everyone else is doing. And there's a chance that two of you will try to change the same part of the code base for two different reasons, and there will be bad consequences as a result of that. So I wouldn't generally start off with a microservice architecture in a small team. I also think it's really difficult to, even in a big team, to build a, build something for the first time using microservices because you don't understand where the boundaries should be. So you learn where the boundaries are by building stuff. So I would start by just building a monolith. And then when you, be, when you become aware that there's a part of that that always changes together and that, that begins to represent a domain, you can extract that out as a service. I think that's the, the obvious way to go. This is not what the FT did or, or not completely. And we, we actually built, when we adopted microservices, three different groups within the FT adopted a microservices architecture for a new system. But in each case, they were rebuilding an existing system. So rather than extracting services from a monolith, we basically already knew the domain and built a replacement that used our knowledge of the domain to split it up into smaller, smaller services, which, which, you know, I look at it and go, no one would have advised us to do that. Three in parallel, all adopting this quite new technique, but, but it worked. Oh, well, and, and if you too wanted to work for you, you should read Sarah's book. <laughs> Sarah, I'm going to say, uh, a, a huge thank you for your time today uh, and also like thank you for reviewing my last book and my next book so you know this is, this is me giving back um, I really would encourage you to read Sarah's book it's got loads of great insights about okay so there's books talk about the, the, the technical aspects and then this is so you've got a microservice architecture how do you actually make it work in an organizational context so it really is a great read so there's loads more um, fun stories in there I can't remember if you feature the story about the leaking roof in the book, but I don't know if that's really related to microservices or not. Well, that's that's part of my whole becoming like realizing that I was uh, involved in business continuity, and yeah, there was a there was a plumbing issue that ended up dripping water through the roof of the server room on the editorial floor, and we were running around putting uh, plastic over the top of all of the server racks to just try and make sure that because it happened, of course, during newspaper production time so in a newspaper between four and seven is the time where no anything anything goes wrong you you have a, a real constraint but yeah that was that was a fun one it's a glamorous glamorous life the pictures you served me were great um but, <laughs> so thank you so much in your time and also thank you for for writing the book it's great to be able to point people towards that as a resource um uh and it's so it's packed full of great useful advice uh, so thank you so much for your time today thank you and thank you for some great questions subscribe to the go to youtube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming go to conference using the promo code book club visit gotopia.tech to learn more